what I'll do next here is take a look at some, uh, some case studies. Uh, then I will switch over to some of the data sets that I had asked you to bring, and we can look at those interactively. And then, so it's an unstructured remaining catalog class after that point. For you just to make sure you're absolutely comfortable with PCA, and one of the data sets we're going to deal with is a, is a pretty big data set. Up to now, you've kind of looked at very tiny data sets, 50 rows, nine columns, 100 rows. These are not big data sets by any means. In fact, all the work we've done to now, you could probably argue, you say, Kevin, I don't even need to use multivariate methods because the data sets we've looked at, you could just look at it in Excel or MATLAB or whatever your, your preference is. But the one data set we'll look at, to, at, at in today's class is a pretty big data set, it's two, roughly two megabytes, I think it is, and a lot of uh, rows and columns. Before we get there, let's just take a look at a monitoring case study and then uh, we'll wrap up the data. Tabasco's uh, steel mill in the interior. Um, just some background here, they're now called Arsenal of Intel. They've used these process monitoring tools that worked with Dr. John McGregor since the 1990s. And they have about 100 applications of latent variable tools in place. Not all of them are monitoring models, but most of them are latent variable models, whether they're doing monitoring or troubleshooting or control of the processes. But one of the most well-known applications that they they published about this and written in journal articles and conferences is this uh, stable operation supervisor. So stable operations, they want those flat lines we were talking about earlier. <clears throat> and it's a monitoring multivariate monitoring system. The operators don't know it. So it's not presented to the operators as PCA or hotel as T-squared. It's just a stability indicator to them. So the, in context, there, there's this label of steel, molten steel, and that's been poured down here and extruded into slabs. Um, so it's a pretty large scale process from that illustration. The diagram is, there's that molten label, uh, it's being poured out and the extrusion takes place and this, this, the slabs are being uh, produced. As they're coming down here, the outer shell crystallizes. The inner part of the slab is still molten steel. So the risk is, of course, if that outer shell breaks, there's a lot of hot metal flying around, and it, it then cools down immediately on this processing line, jamming it up, and there's the health and safety aspect to that as well. And the loss of material, expensive uh, material that you've spent all your energy upstream processing, and now you've just gone and wasted it. So when that occurs, when that breakout occurs on the outer shell, it's usually at one particular point where it occurs and then everything follows it through. That's the danger that they want to prevent. So from their perspective, they would like a monitoring system that can show them in near real time when they're reaching this dangerous level of operation so that they can take action. And the only action they can take in this process is to slow down the rate of extrusion. Okay, so there's really only one manipulated variable that they have under their, their control is to slow things down. It's obviously not wise to run your whole process at a slow rate. So yes, you could extrude everything extremely slowly, but you would not be able to meet the requirements uh, to produce the amount of product you need to produce within a certain time. So they, they do operate at this kind of knife's edge. It's how far can we run before we fall off the edge of the cliff? Okay, so you're really pushing the limits of your process right to the boundary, and you want to know when you're at the edge so that you can pull back just in time before you go falling over. So this is how they've done it. They've measured a whole variety of temperatures on the slab. So they've got a whole lot of thermocouples instrumented at extrusion, so here's the molten slab coming down over there, you can see the molten material. The thermocouples would be around here that measure the temperature profile of that molten material. 
and they use those temperatures and they add them to, those are some of the variables in the latent variable model, but in addition to that, they take those temperatures and they perform an energy balance. They use a partial differential equation model to monitor the rate of cooling of the metal. And those calculated variables are additional columns in the, in the X matrix. So the X matrix consists of the raw data as well as extra columns of calculated variables which are calculated in real time from the real time temperature measurements. Those go into a model that can use, use that to predict the outer shell temperatures because the thermocouples then, they're not able to put thermocouples on the entire piece of metal. Right? So it's only, the thermocouples are only at a one position. So they use those uh, temperature inputs in a predictive PDE model. So extra calculated columns in your X matrix. Then they present to the operator two indexes, stability index one and stability index two. One of them is SPE, the other is T squared. Okay. That's all it is. And they rescale the T squared and the SPE axis so that the 95% limit is at 0.8 and the 99% limit is at 1. So it's just a simple re rescaling of the Y axis of the Z. The reason for that is so that they, because your SPE limit and your T squared limits are not going to be the same numerically, and the 95% and the 99% values of those two values of SPE and T squared are not the same. So they simply rescale both so that 0.8 represents the 95% limit in orange and the 99% limit is in red. So the operator is seeing the current point as well as about 10 minutes of history. That's important for process monitoring. Not just to see your most recent data point, you have to see it in the context of your previous operation. So here, prior to this point, they weren't extruding. They started extruding over here. SPE and T squared start at their respective values, and then they move around. And as long as they're staying below 0.8, they can extrude at the, at the speed that they're at, or they can even perhaps ramp up the speed slightly if they wanted to. Okay, everything is in control as long as the operators are within that bound below the orange line of 0.8 on, the, on both indexes. So they're trained to monitor both indices. So what their one-sided monitoring charts, there's warning limits and action limits. In the middle here, they have a two-sided monitoring chart. There's two axes, and I'm not entirely sure what, those, what this variable is being tracked as here in the middle. Uh, in addition to those two variables, T squared and SPE, there obviously there's a whole lot of other information here, and I believe these are temperatures uh, and, and other metrics. So the fact that they're all green indicates that they're all within their, their univariate limits. So these would be your univariate monitoring charts as long as they're green and the operators want to see the values. So the key thing with the DeFasco system was there wasn't this, some engineer or group of engineers sitting in the office saying, boy, this would be a great idea. Build this system and, and give it to the operators. It was a lot of interaction with the operators. The operators wanted to see these certain numbers because they, they're used to seeing those numbers. And they're comfortable with their interpretation. A number that's ranged between zero and one is a summary of the data, but it's not that interpretable to them, okay? And I'm not going to train the operator and say, well, this is your distance off the model plane, and this is your distance along the model plane, therefore, I don't know what that means. Okay, so they need to present as well some of the other variables in the original units that the operators are comfortable seeing. Okay. <clears throat> When, a, when an alarm occurs, the screen changes to this. I don't, don't know if this is automatic or if the operators had to choose the second screen. But here you can see stability indicator one <coughs> started over here and has now gone above the 0.8. For, as, sorry, the fact that it's red indicates that it's above the one level limit. So it's above the 99% limit on either T squared or SP, I'm not sure which. And then over here, they've shown the contributions 
sorted by the largest contributors. So the first variable that's got the largest contribution, so the operators in this case, they don't click like you have to do in the software and generate a contribution plot manually. The moment the signal goes above T squared of SPE, this software will create the contribution plot automatically, sort it from high to low, and only present the top five largest bars to the operators. So they know now that the stop is going to remain in the loose upper 1TC and the loose lower 6TC temperature controller, presumably, are the major contributors. And they can click on those variables on these bars and get the raw data if they needed to. Or they could be well-trained operators that they know when they see this signature what the problem is. In either event, the operator's only recourse is to slow down the processing line to save the, the, um, the molten material, uh, to save the extruded bar from not breaking out. So they really only have one course of action anyway, but this is useful for them to try and correct the problem. Right? So you can slow it down, that will prevent the breakout from occurring, but it's not going to get back to that earlier issue that we said with, with the monitoring. You detect the problem, you diagnose it, but then you have to go fix it, right? The reason why you go fix it is so that you can beat the pants off your competitors. If you don't fix your problems, you'll keep having that problem over and over again, and you'll always be, be sending operators or, or uh, engineers to chase this problem. But if you see this problem recurring several times, you, you diagnose, you've detected it, you've diagnosed it, now you can go fix the problem you'll be able to be like the Japanese who consistently beat the pants off North America for their quality because that's exactly what they do. They go fix the problem and prevent it from ever reoccurring. If any of you go on and work for Toyota here in North America or you read more about Toyota's way of working or the general Japanese philosophy for manufacturing, that is exactly what they do. They fix the problems to prevent them from occurring. So that's why they have the contributions there, even though there's only really one action the operator can take. Okay. In addition to the contributions, there's a few other variables. Those same univariate variables show up over here as well. So this is, I think, the second version of the, um, the monitoring system. Here's an earlier version that they published in a, in a different journal article. They actually had, they, they called this SPE alarm. And they, to get the contributions, the operator had to go click SPE influences and then it would show the contributions on a second screen. That was, on, this was the first version, so after a while of using this, the operators were saying, well, you know this is tedious that I have to go click on this button to get the contributions. That's when they changed the system to be like this, where it shows the contributions automatically in a different way, on the same screen as the monitoring chart. So again, the operators had a lot of influence on the design of the system. They called their two T-squared uh, monitors. I don't know the exact details why, but here was HT1 and HT2. So here they had, they were probably building two monitoring models that monitor different aspects of the process, would be my guess. Where Hotelling's T-squared 1, in this particular case, was not alarming, but Hotelling T-squared 2 was alarming. And probably in the second version of the monitoring system, they were able to combine those two times T squared. Also, some of this detail here has changed between version one and version two. Um, and this would this would be the plot. Okay, so the moment SPE alarms, as the cases over here, you see this alarm in red with SPE. They clicked on that SPE influences button up at the top left, and it would take them to a complete second screen that look like this, that would show the various contributions. So here you see these variables highlighted over here with the main contributors. What's interesting and what I like about this is that they show the contribution plot in context of the process, okay? So when you generate the, con the contribution plot in the software, you just get a bar plot. But here they've actually shown the contribution plots in a very interesting way, in a way that the operator can immediately relate to the problem and see it geometrically in context of the, the object being extruded here in the mold. Okay. So 
This has saved a ton of money for the FASCO. They implemented the system from 97, and then subsequently they've had fewer and fewer breakouts every year. So more than a million dollars saved per year. And in fact, most of their saving is, isn't due to the lack of breakouts. It's due to the fact that they can now operate at higher throughputs and produce more products on the same manufacturing line. So a company that would be in this position without a monitoring system, they'd have to consider building a second extrusion line in order to keep up with market demand. But in the Vasco's case, they could get away with keeping the same line, just operating at higher throughput and with fewer breakouts, presumably. Okay, so the monitoring system here has, has, has saved in two ways. Okay, any, any questions on that? I, I don't know the system too well. I, I do know a few of the people who were involved in this development. Uh, but the details I just mentioned there are, are about what I know. They don't talk too much about <laughs> for competitive advantage. Yeah. Do you know if they bought that software package or if they developed it? It was all developed in-house. And the reason for that is they want to be able to get to that data in real time. Okay, so I didn't mention this, but between detecting the problem over here on the on the support on the SPE, the operator has has about 10 seconds before the breakup will occur. So they they need that data really fast. You can't wait for your, your software to get the database. Well, what happens in most companies is that you can get the data out of the database, but only about a minute or two after, after the data has been recorded in the database. There's a certain latency of it. They needed the data really right away from the PLCs or from the, from the uh, measuring equipment. They do the calculations in, in close to real time and present the results to the operator in next to real time. The operators about the only screen that they watch in their operating panel is this screen. Because it's such a concise summary of all the, all the problems and all the variation in the system. Okay. Um, I was going to talk about another case study. I'll, I'll maybe leave this for another day. This was a, one of the case studies I was involved in uh, and I, just after I graduated here. It was a lumber company up in Quebec. and. I can talk about this, but again, we did the same thing. We didn't we didn't call it photonics T squared. We called it a stability indicator. And as long as they were in the green zone, they were okay. And they moved outside the red zone. Uh, the problems were occurring, and the, and the contributions were actually given as text in this case. Not as not as because there were about 50, 60 variables. So we we didn't want to show a contribution plot with that many columns on it. So we just picked out the, the five, six largest contributions and displayed those as writing on the screen. Um, just some other things that uh, we'll look at it at a case study now um, that where we're looking at raw materials. You can monitor raw materials, or you can obviously monitor your end order, your, uh, your final product quality, final quality coming off your process. We'll talk about those. Those are two very powerful monitoring systems that don't need to be on, on a process in real time, but can be extremely powerful. The online system uh, we just spoke about. I also just want to talk here about endpoint detection for a minute and then we'll look at the data system. What? Yeah, please. I think this one is on the So, endpoint monitoring is another very interesting interesting uh, monitoring system. So this is a little bit of a, this is not a usual monitoring system in the way that uh, we, we've just spoken about, but it, it works in the same way. So endpoint monitoring, what I mean by that is many chemical processes or many systems work as follows. You put material into, into a unit and you turn that unit on and the material starts to react and at some point you stop the unit and that point where you stop it is the end point which is often empirically determined so the company I work at in many cases the, the end point comes from the operator putting his or her hand on the equipment and when it vibrates in a certain way they know that's when the end point is reached if they keep going beyond that the product actually starts to degrade so endpoint monitoring is basically 
if you're looking at the time perspective, you're going along and then you reach some optimum and then you, you, you fall off if you keep going beyond that optimum. And endpoint monitoring aims to stop your process at that peak. The point is, we cannot measure this variable. So this is some fictitious variable that's called optimum, which we don't know. Okay, we can't measure it because I can't create a variable of an operator putting his or her hand on the equipment and I don't know what they're feeding and vibrating. <laughs> like it's vibrating in a certain way, that's when I stop. And if that operator goes on vacation, we can't run the process. <laughs> if they die, <laughs> we can't run the process. I mean, it, but that happens, and it's not just that. Another classic example is uh, drying, fluidized bed drying. So you charge your material into um, equipment like this. So you charge, you've got your air coming in, and you've got your equipment, and you've got your particles just being held in suspension by the, by the warm air. And leaving at the top is some filter there to prevent you from just blowing your particles right out. But the air coming out, you can measure its temperature, its humidity, and the incoming air you can measure its temperature, and there's a few other variables in, in the system that you can measure. And you're drying these particles with hot air, so the humidity leaving will, you will get an increase in humidity initially, so humidity might be something like this, and then stabilize and then fall off again, okay? And temperature might, might start off high, sorry, it start off low and then go up and then stabilize to the inlet air temperature. So you're using up a lot of your energy to dry off the, the particles initially. And, you, and you've got that similar trajectories for a couple of the variables. What we do with endpoint detection is we actually build a monitoring model, a PCA model, on this period of data where we would like to say that's where the optimum is. Okay? So this comes from experience where, and actually comes from many design experiments. We run the process for 20 minutes, for 25 minutes, for 30 minutes, for 35 minutes, and we measure the properties of the material at those different points in time, and we say, okay, for that process and for that raw material, the end point is an, at an optimum when the temperature, sorry, or the humidity, rather, is at such and such conditions, or when the temperature are at these conditions. So we'll repeat that a few times and we build up a data set as follows, where our X matrix consists of some monitoring model, so we only put good data in here, so this will be batch one. And you'll maybe take samples at these points of time, so take those five data points, one, two, three, four, five. So those are the five rows from batch one of the certain K variables. Batch two, we might have six particular observations for the second batch when we run this experiment. And then batch three, we might only have four observations, and so on. The main point is that we build up this X matrix with only points at which we are sure we're at the end point. at the desirable point where we would like to terminate the process. If we go beyond this, we're going to damage the particles. We're going to overcook them. We're going to toast them. They're not going to have the properties that we would like. If we under, under dry, the product is going to be too damp and we're not going to be able to process it on the downstream operation. So the key is, from known batches, we take good data where we, we say we would have liked to stop the process Anywhere in this region would have been a good point of time to stop. A good time to stop. Anything outside that region would be a bad point to stop. Okay? So that's our X matrix. We build our PCA model just on those data from endpoints 
from different batches, so you get a, a bit of variability. In when we monitor now, in the future, <coughs> We actually monitor T squared versus SP. So here's my T squared, here's my SP, here's my SP limit, and here's my T squared limit. Okay. And what happens is as the batch starts off, when the batch is over here, near the beginning of time, where do you think the point lies in the SPE T squared plot? Way outside. That point way lies, it's off the, off the charts, it's usually kind of out here. Okay. Because if that point at the beginning of the back is so different, totally different from the data where you built your, your operation. And as you're, as you're pointing there, as the batch progresses, there's this, there's this, it moves around there and then starts to go out again. If you, if you don't stop the batch, it will, it will just do this. It just comes in and goes out again. Okay. And that's what we monitor. We just plot this and the operators look at this and the moment it comes into this region, and stays here for a couple of observations because it's a noisy variable. It's not that you might move around a little bit here. But the general trend, if you plot successive batches over and over, they all kind of do this. On another process, they could just as well have done this. Okay. Just on our particular system, it happens to do kind of that way. And you stop your process when you're in there. If you keep going, you'll, ex you'll exceed your end. So that's a different way of monitoring process, but it uses the same principle. Okay. Companies use the same sort of tool for credit card financial fraud. You're monitoring credit cards to see unusual transactions. You monitor the same thing. So there's types of variables you'd be monitoring of how much is the transaction for? Where was the transaction? Was it in a different country that you normally have transactions? So anything that you can use this transactional data in your X matrix and a high SPE and a high T squared can throw up a fraud signal. And what's better is it's not just going to say, oh, there's a fraud. It can tell you why. You can go look at the contribution plot and tell you, okay, I flagged two or three variables as being unusual. This is why it might block this kind of fraud. And I've seen this also being used in human resources. Google actually uh, has <laughs> It's a bit of a terrible monitoring model, but they can monitor the employees and they're able to predict before the employees know even that they're going to leave the company. So they monitor employee <laughs> happiness and are able to predict a good accuracy when uh, the employees are not happy. <laughs> Usually not, they, they do leave off. So uh, you can monitor anything basically is the key. As long as you're aware of what you're monitoring, what's on the plane and what's below SPEs is good, normal, consistent data. Anything outside is going to show up in, in your alarms and in your contribution model. Okay, any questions on that before we start looking at some of the case studies? Okay, the first case study um, is, I'm gonna open the door here just to get some fresh air in a minute, but what I'd like you to do is go open the data file Data file called raw material characterization. So it should look like that. If you don't click beyond that point, I just need to show you to point out something to you. screen, by default it will gray out this column, the outcome column. So what, let me just quickly describe this data set to you. It's a very straightforward data set. 
the numbers in this data set are from an actual problem, from a real from a real company. I just disguised the the type of operation. It's not actually a plastics operation, um, and but the, the the outcome and the and the variables other than that are identical. So this is a it's a real data set of a problem that actually occurred. What happened here is that we were talking earlier on. We had an illustration of the of the simple flow sheet A, B, and C. So we had our raw materials coming in, and we had unit A, B, and C, and there was some recycle of the This company has 50, uh, 24, 23 batches, so N is equal to 23 in this case. Every single one of these rows represents the raw material properties. So there's six raw materials. They take the plastic and they measure the particle size below 5%, 10%, and 15 Then they take that plastic sample and put it through three instruments, the TGA, thermogravimetric analysis, DSC, and TMA. And those two acronyms, I don't know off the top of my head. You know what DSC is? Differential and TMA. Okay, it's another, basically it's measuring three different properties on the plastic. And then the X, 5, 10, and 15 are the particle size measurements. When they take that batch of raw material and they put it through their process, they characterize the outcome either as adequate or poor. Okay. So this batch over here with these properties, after running it through their system, the output is adequate. The product that they produce from this batch is poor product. So, what the question is, and I'm going to let you work on this data set for about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll work through the class together. I'm going to ask you to figure out why different batches are good and different batches are bad. Bearing in mind, basically, each batch over here is about a million dollars worth of material. Okay? So, for this company, Every poor line costs them a lot of money to get that data point. <laughs> okay, so there's not too many poors in this data set because this company is hopefully producing more good product than bad. But they really want to understand what it is that's causing bad product. Um, so what I'd like you to do is click on that outcome variable and just call it a secondary variable. Don't exclude it. Just change it to a secondary variable and then proceed as normal. Then continue on with your normal analysis like you normally do. And I'm going to ask you to do the following. When you build your model, leave out the last three observations. So omit, uh, don't exclude it here. Keep it in the data set, but when you go to the normal exclude button in the software, leave out batch 745, 380. 986, the last three rows. Okay. Now I have put in the data set. I have you, we obviously know that these this batch is poor, adequate, adequate. Okay? So what I want you to do though is leave out the three data sets, uh, those three points, and then see if you can make predict. Use your you treat it as a monitoring system where you build your monitoring chart on the first 20 rows and then use these last three rows and predict whether those are good or bad data. Good or bad operation. Okay. So two things. Tell me why, what causes bad batches, and secondly, can you predict accurately whether these are good or bad? Okay. So let's work on it for 10 minutes or so on your computer and then we'll take it up together.
Choose coloring and then change the coloring to outcome. And that will help you. Mm -hmm. 
And then uh, you can add a legend as well. So right click property, uh, right click and add legend. So in green, you've got the training data that's bad, and training data is bad. Yeah, I'm going to 
Since you've identified contributions, let's take a look at the loadings. So here I've got the score plot up. Uh, the green batches then are, are my bad batches, and the black is good. And we notice that most of the bad batches are down with high T1, but low T2, negative T2. So one convenient plot is also the by plot. To analyze loadings by plot, you can say, okay, 
initially it will throw up a loading block superimposed on the score. Is that just helpful? Uh, I think I've, I've done the wrong one. Sorry. Uh, I'm on a different model. So go back to model one. Loading spy plot. Okay, that's much better. So blue points are my scores. Black points are my loadings. So there's my size between 5 and 10. DSCs up here, TMA and TGA over there. But I've lost my color coding, so let's bring that back. Um, properties, coloring, are uh, by outcome this time, okay? And it's back to how I was. So I can see here from the loading spot superimposed on the scores, I get the same interpretation as I get for my contributions. I can see that batches that are, are up here, high values of T1, have high particle size 5, 10, and 15. Is that clear? These, are, these loadings are at the positive, uh, high positive P's. These scores have high T1 values. So these batches over here should be, char should be characterized by high values of size 15, 10, and 5. Okay. And in fact, you could say, I expect yeah. that batch that was marked as good to also have high values of 5, 10, and 15. Because it's also, look, it's got the same T1 value as that bad batch over there. But remember that the loadings plot is just a generalization of the model space. A contribution plot is telling you exactly why the particular point is in our life. The loadings plot will tell you the general reason for why variables lie in different parts of the small space. So in general, we know values, uh, sorry, observations up here with high T1 scores should have the characteristics of high size, 5, 10, but remember that that point on the score plot is a linear combination of all my x's. And so I can get that point there by adjusting these x's, but also by adjusting some of the other x's. Right? So this point's a linear combination. So to find out exactly why that score is at that location, the correct thing to do is to plot a contribution plot. But since I'm seeing all my green points clustering here, it's quite correct to also look at the loadings plot to see what the general reason is. So you should have noticed as you as you did, you probably did individual contribution plots for every one of these points. You picked up the same kind of story, same high particle size for, for all the bad batches. You could also argue somewhat that this that these points here have low values of the TMA and TGA variable. And you would have probably seen that in your contribution plots as well. And if you looked at the raw data, that those points had low values. Yeah. So looking at that, can we say that if we, for some reason, couldn't adjust the size, we would just have to adjust the TGA, TMA accordingly, and then those ones might work out? Like okay, so you're asking a good question, but in this case, you can't adjust any of these axes, these, these variables. Because these are the final properties we just measure in the labs. On the, on the, we take our raw material and we put it into our process. We just get that raw material from our supplier. So we can't adjust that material. What we can go do is we can tell our supplier, you know, if you ship me raw materials and they land in this part of my score plot, I'm going to send that raw material back to you. I'm not going to use it because I know it's going to cause me, I'm going to waste a million dollars. Okay, so, and that, that's exactly what this company ended up doing. They told their, their raw material supplier, you better send us raw materials that are like this and not like that. Because if you send us this stuff, we're shipping it back to you. Okay, we're not going to buy this. Because we know if we put it through our process, we're going to get a bad batch. Okay. And so the raw material supplier asks, well, how do I know what's going to be a good batch and a bad batch? <laughs> well, they say, well, send us material that has what type of particle size? Smaller size. And what type of properties on your TMA and TGA? And it's up to them to figure out how to adjust their process to get small particle sizes and high values on their TMA. It's not our problem, okay? Unless we're producing the raw materials ourselves in-house, then we have to figure it out. But in this case, we were able to say, you've got the problem in your hand, we're not buying material from you that's got these bad properties. Okay, so we figured out why bad batches are bad. Now, if we had to build this model, we've built this model now, but we've dropped out these three variables. Are you able to predict accurately whether these batches are going to be good or bad? Did any of you get to that step yet? 
Okay, so work on that for, for a couple of minutes. Figure out a way that you can pretend that your, your, custom, your supplier, your own material supplier is shipping you these three badges. And your boss has told you, you're responsible for predicting whether we should keep this batch or whether we should ship it back to our customer. And that's, what, that's ultimately what we're wanting to tell from this work. Can we tell, before we even use this batch of raw materials, whether it's going to be good or bad? So give that a try for a couple of minutes. And then we'll So originally we had 40 or something, and it's, it's all, we knew the answer. Oh, 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 Okay, so we've got one group that's able to predict successfully if they're good or bad. Anyone else being able to tell? Someone's won the competition. Slow, come on. If you're able to solve this problem, you're solving a problem that the company took six months to figure out. You're doing it in ten minutes.
Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, have a discussion. I would, Brandon, you guys had a had an interesting way that I was overhearing you. Uh, so I'd like you to discuss describe to the class what your approach was that you were trying to do. That, that may not have worked out. Okay, so no, no, I want you to. So if you, if you, you can tell the class what yeah, you're sure. to do. So our original plan was that we, we know for the uh, training data what's good and what's bad. Okay. So we thought if we built a PPA model on the good data, that we'd be able to uh, use that to predict, like, to make a new model. Use you know, just a model of the good data. So just a PCA on good data. Just a on good data, and then hopefully you know, we, the limit would cut off on bad data, but that doesn't work that way. Okay, so what happened, so you built a model on only the good data, yeah. and you brought in as a prediction set which type of data? Everything. Everything. So all your data, that yeah. even the training data, as well as these three batches, as well as the previous bad batch that you excluded. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. And what happened to your bad batches? Where did they lie? Most of them were outliers, but we had two that were outliers. Okay, so two outliers on which plot? Um, that's square and t squared. Okay, so both. So you looked at both your SP and t squared, and for most of the batches, it worked except for two of them. For two of them, unfortunately, one of them was batch seven forty five. Okay. Okay. So batch seven. You so. Okay, so if you you could calculate your type one error for that. Type two error for that. Because you know what the truth is, you can say, well, this is what my model predicted, and you can show how well your model performs. So 745, you weren't able to predict. Were you able to predict 380 and 986 is adequate? Um, <laughs> we got 380. 986 was close to the, to the line, so it was Inside just out. slightly out. Just slightly out. So, okay. yeah. But in a different way, that was out on the SPE. The, the other one, the 745, we misclassified it, but it was closest to the so okay, so this group over here built a data only on the good. I uh, built a model only on the good data set, and then tried to predict on all the other data, and hoping that your your bad batches would show up as outliers. Okay, and that's the usual monitoring approach. Now, Charlene, you and Jake and uh, yes, sorry, I don't know if you want. To. Okay, so Charlene, would you describe to the class the approach you took? Um, yeah, we did. Um, we did and um, well, we knew that in the bottom right corner we were bad data. Okay, so bottom right hand corner, this, you, so you're saying this is my bad data region. Yeah. And then yeah, and then we kept the same model, but we basically excluded. So we excluded all the points that are in there, and then we just they gave you the same PC model to show the three. Okay. Models. So you guys didn't do any extra modeling. You used your existing model. And you just brought these three data in as testing data, and you used your score space. Tell whether the data were good or bad. You didn't use your T's, you didn't use your SPE uh, space. Okay, so two different approaches. And how was your success? Were you able? Where did 745 lie? In your good region or bad region? Well, so our really well, what we decided was our really bad region was the lower right hand quadrant. So this is really really bad. Yeah, and then but it was 745 in the lower left. Yeah, so we decided, but there's another point that the 9.2 is also in that quadrant. So we decided that the top half was good. Sorry, like the top, the top, the hemisphere of the circle was good. Okay. And then, um, but if it's not lower, then yeah, it's like maybe. So, I don't know. Okay, so this is your maybe region. Yes. And then this is your definitely That's good region. Yeah. Okay. Perfectly valid approach, yeah. Um, but what about point yeah. five thirty five? It's like right beside 7.45, and it's good. Okay, so you, you, you're right. So here's, you're referring to the, the fact that those, if you look at the original data set, there's a good point right next to a bad point. Yeah. Okay. Just, it's okay. Fun. okay, so now you, you're raising action questions. Firstly, let's just say 
the two approaches that were described here are perfectly valid approaches and both of them work roughly to the same degree of success. Neither group was able to predict 745 as a bad batch, but you, were, you got the moderate success on the other two. Now, it comes back to what the point that Caroline raised. What is the quality of our training data? The fact that we've got these two data points right next to each other on the score space, yet one is good and one is bad. What's going on here? Poor measurements, random noise. What what else could there be? I think I remember. I think for us, we noticed that with the TMA and the T uh, yeah. test, they were like they had to be high and it was okay. But I think in the bad batch, they're not that high. So like it. Um, so so the TMA TK had to be high for I think for it to be good. Yeah. For it to be good. Okay, and for this, for these two batches, they weren't necessarily quite as high as as the other good batches. Um, I think it's fine. They have to be yeah. high. Yeah. Okay, but for one. the good one in the low right beside the bad one, the TGA and the TMA were high. Okay. But for the bad one, it's in the low. Okay, so just to come back to Carol's point, one thing that could be the issue here, and I don't really know. Remember, we're taking the raw materials six properties and we're imputing what's going to happen after several processing steps over here. And this is where good and bad is quantified. Okay. Right here at the end. So it could be that this batch, the one that's good, should have been bad because maybe the operator misclassified it as being good or bad. So there's ambiguity about what's a good batch and what's a bad batch. Is the operator having to make when the operator had to make that decision of good versus bad for the good point over here, maybe they're, they're like, well, this could go either way, or I'm going to go with good, okay, to kind of maybe save some money for the company. Or it could be that, sure, the raw materials for that product going in were bad, but due to the processing conditions in these units here, you were able to save the batch and put in enough work on the material or change the reactions in this in these sequence of steps were enough to overcome the badness of your raw material and actually create a reasonable product that turned out to be okay, adequate. So either of those two could be answers to your question here. Remember, we're, we're going right from the beginning and predicting what's going to happen all the way at the end. We haven't got any data on the intermediate steps. Okay, so that could also explain why we're not able to get a hundred percent successful prediction. But I like what you had done is that you said, here's my definitely bad region, here's my maybe region, and here's my definitely okay region. Because you can then say, well, maybe these batches, we, we maybe need to do a bit more work and think, how do we run our processes to make those batches good? Maybe we're not in the position, some companies are not, where I'm not a big enough buyer of your material that I can be choosy about what I'm gonna buy from you, okay? Maybe I'm, I'm a, just a small player and I can't influence you. Maybe I'm a mining company and the raw materials are the product I pull out of the ground. Or maybe I, I'm a food manufacturing company and it's wheat grown in a farmer's field and I have to process that wheat to make bread. There's no way, some companies can't choose their raw materials, other companies can, okay? Or what happens in some cases is the maybe material can be sent to a different process which is not going to be, um, which is not going to be uh, affected by the quality of the raw material. Okay, so this gives you a bit of flexibility. Always use this material. This material maybe divert to another process, and this material scrap it or send it back to the supplier or or do something else with it. Okay. So so there's a lot of <laughs> flexibility there, and this ambiguity of some points working and some points not working is common. Whenever you see a variable marked as bad or good, yes or no, true or false, you're always going to build your model. There's always going to be false positives and there's always going to be false negatives. Because at the end of the day, the decision for good and bad, true and false, is a human decision and not perfect either. Okay. Any questions, other questions on this? We didn't get around to the other data set, which um, which is a pity. So what I'll do is, 
what we've done up to now is we've covered PCA in, in very little detail. And normally for these classes, by now we would have started with PLS already. I've opted to really consolidate the understanding of PCA so you can be really comfortable with it. When we get back after Thanksgiving, we'll look at least squares and why least squares has some shortcomings. We'll look at principal components regression that uses PCA and then makes predictions from those PCA models. And then we'll move into PLS. Hopefully all within the same class. And uh, so this other data set I wanted to look at, we can actually look at it in terms of PLS when we, when we get to PLS. So I'm not too worried about it. Okay, so thanks for your work, your assignments, and have a good Thanksgiving.